Okay, we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Michael Speaks. I'm Dean of the School of Archi Architecture here at Syracuse uh, University School of Architecture. I guess I said architecture twice, but we like to say architecture here. Um, uh, I'm going to read a little bit off of my phone, which I hope I'll be able to. I don't normally like to read, but uh, Snowetta has done uh, so many things that I won't be able to remember them all. Um, <laughs> Uh, but let me just remind you, this is the first lecture in uh, three. Uh, all are finalists for the National uh, Veterans Resource Complex at the competition we're running here on campus. Uh, the site is on the corner of Krauss and Waverly. And we're very excited to have three incredible finalist firms. The first tonight, um, I'll introduce in a second. Uh, the second lecture will be on the 31st of March, will also be here. Uh, that will be Shop Architects. Uh, and the, the third will be the 7th of April, and uh, that will be David Ajay. Um, but tonight, we don't have either of those, we have somebody else. Um, we have Craig Dykers from Snohetta, which is... Uh, an absolutely amazing firm. We're thrilled uh, to have them here. We're thrilled to have them as part of the series. Um, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the lecture tonight. None of these lectures will be lectures uh, featuring their proposals for the competition. All of, all of these lectures will be lectures really about their work. So they're going to talk about their work uh, and the context of their work. Um, so let me just make a brief introduction uh, for Craig, and I'll let him uh, get going. Um, Craig is a graduate of the University of Texas uh, at Austin. I uh, studied architecture there. Started Snohetta in 1989 and, uh, in Oslo. Uh, so, the, so the firm has a, a number of studios and a number of offices, but the principal one initially was in 89 in Oslo. And then in 19... What year did you start? 2004, uh, the New York office was, uh, was started. Uh, Craig is a founding partner uh, in, in the whole firm, so he helped found uh, the, the Oslo office and then obviously the New York office in 2004. In the last probably six or seven years, they have completed a number of pretty remarkable projects in North America, some of which you probably know, um, some of which you may not. Um, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to read a little bit off here so I can remind myself of them and you because there's so many, even with such a remarkable memory as I have, <laughs> I cannot remember all of these. Um, so as founding partner of Snowetta, Craig Dykers has led many of their prominent projects, I'm reading, if you didn't know, uh, <laughs> internationally, including, uh, the very first one was the Alexandria Library in Egypt, an incredible pro uh, project. Did you guys win the Aga Khan Prize for that? Yes. that yeah. Um, uh, so Alexandria Library in Egypt, uh, then the Norwegian National Opera and Ballet in Oslo. If you haven't been to that, to see that, it is absolutely a spectacular thing to see. You can almost dip your toe off the edge of the building into the water in the fjord. It's a pretty remarkable place. Um, then... Uh, Probably the thing that most of you may know about is the September 11 Memorial Museum Pavilion uh, in New York City at Ground Zero, which was finished... Uh, 2014. 2014, fairly recently. Um, they recently completed uh, the University Student Learning Center at Ryerson University in Ontario, Canada, and uh, have won many awards for that. Actually, I was on the AIA New York... Design Awards, and uh, we awarded that a, a, a high prize, I think the highest prize, two weeks ago. Uh, Dykers is currently leading the design of the San Francisco Mu Museum of Modern Art expansion in San Francisco and the Times Square reconstruction in New York City, uh, both of which will be completed this year, as well as the Calgary Public uh, Library in Alberta, Canada, and the Temple University Library in Philadelphia. Snowda has also uh, recently been shortlisted as one of the seven firms in consideration for the Obama Presidential Library in Chicago. Uh, Dyker's work has led to numerous international awards and widespread recognition, including the Miss Van der Rohe uh, European Union Prize, which is a remarkable prize, 
uh, for, for contemporary architecture, the World Architecture Award and the Aga Khan Award, uh, among many others. Active professionally and academically, Dykers has been uh, the diploma adjudicator at the Architectural College in Oslo, a distinguished professor at City College in New York City, and a visiting critic at our own New York City studio, um, as a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, he's also lectured extensively in Europe and elsewhere. Um, I want you to join your hands and well, help me welcome Craig Dykers from Snow Island. Hello. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to return to Syracuse. Um, I've actually been here quite a number of times, not only in relation to the short uh, semester that I taught at the Manhattan campus of Syracuse, but as you'll see in a moment, we had a project uh, up in Kingston in Ontario, and it was tradition for me to uh, fly to Syracuse, rent a car, and then drive up through the Thousand Islands area to, um, to Kingston to visit the site. Um, <clears throat> during those trips, I would often set aside some time because I didn't just like taking the main uh, road up there in any way. I, I got too many traffic tickets driving too quickly on the road north. There's one town that's something just north of here where you always get a speeding ticket. But um, I, uh, I would get off the road and drive and so I went. I've even been to Mexico, which uh, is a funny little town on the way to the lake, Lake Ontario. Um, so I, I've seen quite a bit and I used to stop here eat and, and uh, either on my return or on my way to Kingston. So I know this, this town reasonably well and I'm, I'm happy to be back. Uh, our office, as was mentioned, uh, is name, has a rather strange name, Snehetta, and it's the name of a mountain. You may think you have not heard the name of this mountain, uh, but you actually have because I'm sure that you've heard the word Valhalla or the name Valhalla. Valhalla is the ancient uh, Norse um, palace that existed inside, mythologically inside the mountain of Snohetta. So uh, in that sense, it's a home of a rather fantastical place. And uh, we, we enjoy the mountain because it's both beautiful and um, iconic. And uh, it's a, it houses both landscape and architecture, which are equally important to our office. Uh, we take trips to the mountain from time to time. so. We sometimes say people won't take you seriously if you don't uh, actually climb the mountain that you're named after. So uh, we do that once in a while. Every couple of years we get a bunch of people together and we, we uh, give it a shot to make it to the top. Um, we have a good time together. We get to know each other better uh, during the climb and after the climb. Uh, as was mentioned, we have a number of studios. Our biggest studios are in New York and in Oslo. We also have a studio in Innsbruck, in San Francisco. Singapore, and recently we've started uh, thinking about opening a studio in Melbourne in Australia. So uh, all of these studios act somewhat independently, I won't say completely independently, but they're all self-sustaining. Our office is not the kind of office that has a corporate structure that dictates how everyone should function, but we try to nurture a collegial atmosphere where we share thoughts in such abundance that people begin to understand how everyone else is working and they create things in a, in, in, with guidance that is similar across the various studios. Um, our studios are set up in a very unique way. Uh, so you, we remove the, uh, the receptionist from the door, uh, so you enter through the kitchen in, 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 our, in our studios. Um, in the kitchen in New York, which this is a, an older, the old kitchen we used to have, um, we, but still it's set up the same way today. Uh, we installed a beer tap in the kitchen, which was kind of funny, and well, it's, it's nice to have a beer tap. Um, but people didn't take us too seriously, uh, so we had to put a fruit bowl in the foreground so that we could look a little bit healthy. Um, and uh, people like to hang out in the kitchen, and it's a nice way to enter the office. It creates an informal atmosphere that is, um, is pleasant uh, for people as they arrive. Uh, immediately adjacent to the kitchen are very large tables which we eat at and we also work at. So um, these are our meeting room tables really. Uh, we don't try not to use the se segregated meeting space which is really primarily for, for video conferencing. Most people um, sit on the table and they'll eat there at lunchtime or work together uh, as they uh, move through the day and that's very important. And occasionally we uh, occupy these rooms as a highly collaborative space. Uh, where um, up to 60 people 
can interact with one another on a project. We, we like to work in groups. Uh, we like to invite the people that we're working with into our studio and help us actually create uh, the models and the things uh, that we're working on together as a group. Uh, so the interaction is very important to us and we have all types of ways of pro projecting on the walls and messing up the tables and things like that. Uh, we're an, an unusual mix of, of, of disciplines. We like to say we're transdisciplinary. So the majority of us are architects, but we're also landscape architects, interior architects, and branding and graphic designers, all working together in one studio. We don't silo the seating, so it's possible that a branding designer might sit next to an architect or landscape architect sits next to an architect. And all the projects are developed from the very core with all of these disciplines working together. A landscape architect might draw architecture or vice versa. There's no rules or regulations saying that you have to stay within your field of interest. So we, we um, role play occasionally whenever we can. And uh, that helps us create things together. And we're always making stuff together. And I like this picture a lot because it's very hard to get people to work together to begin with. But to get people to make a model together, a physical object together, is really very difficult. And it takes a great deal of nurturing to have this atmosphere exist. So I, in this case, the person in the upper right with the blue shirt at the top is actually an intern. So he was only there from Mexico for a couple of weeks and uh, working together with some of the other architects and they had, had the intern had just as much as validity as anyone else in the room and we were able to spark uh, new conversations uh, amongst ourselves in this process. There's, I'm here together with uh, one of my colleagues, Aaron Dorf, who uh, has worked on many of the projects that you'll see tonight and he's here in the front so that's Aaron there and there's Aaron here so there's like the real one and that's the projected one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is Aaron working uh, with the group on a project in Haiti, uh, which was a big workshop where we had the client and, and others all working together to create a concept, not only for the building, but for the branding and identity of the, of the project. Um, Aaron has is, is, uh, quite, been quite influential in actually most of the projects that you'll see today, but there are a number of other people I wanted to share names with. We have actually three Syracuse graduates working in our office. Uh, the longest uh, serving has been Mario Mohan, if any of you teachers might have known Mario or some of his friends are here tonight. Uh, this is a great story. Mario, uh, who's in, and who went to school here, um, met his girlfriend at the roof of the opera that we designed in Oslo. They didn't meet there, but they, met, they went there together and he proposed uh, to her on the roof of our opera in Norway. So that's uh, a nice story and there they are, uh, he's uh, giving her the ring and she said yes and uh, <laughs> everything is nice. Um, there's a few other people that uh, um, are working in our office, Jeffrey Chung and Chris uh, Cobell. Uh, um, there's Jeff and there's Chris. Uh, they're they're um, also people that have uh, graduated uh, from, from Syracuse. Uh, one thing I would like to say is that it's for us very important to, to ask a question, and one question is, well, why do we do all of this? Why are, what, what does all of this mean? Um, and that's an interesting question. What is the value of all of this interactivity? Um, this is a picture that I saw many years ago, and uh, when I saw it, it, I was, of course, moved by the, the, the violent quality of it. And I thought to myself, like many of you might also think, well, this is a tragic situation. Uh, why can't these people get along? Uh, they seem to not like each other. They must have a, a, a difference of opinion that's too vast to, to, to bridge. And when we see an image like this, we often blame someone else for this type of, of problem. We'll say, well, it's obviously one of these two people is crazy, or some politi politician has made them into the, these creatures. Uh, there's someone else always that we blame. We never blame ourselves, and especially as architects, we think we're outside of these kinds of social conditions. But if you look at the picture, you'll see that this tragic event is occurring in a designed space, a space that someone made for them. It's, a, it's an urban space, it's an architectural space, and to a certain extent, those spaces that we create can either foster civil behavior or they can remove civil behavior. And I thought more about that, and I remember reading 
uh, this wonderful comment by Marshall McLuhan, the environment humans create becomes their medium for defining their role in it. And that is absolutely true about the spaces that we make. So to put that into some perspective, imagine if you go to the zoo and you see a polar bear in a polar bear cage, and the polar bear is pacing aggressively back and forth, licking its fur off of its skin, looking very aggressive, feeling very uncomfortable. But it's very likely that that condition exists because the, the cage for the polar bear is inappropriate for its natural lifestyle. It's living in a domesticated condition that's not appropriate for how it should live. Well, we do this to ourselves. The polar bear didn't ask to be put in the cage, but in terms of human behavior, we self-domesticate on a regular basis. We build our own cages around ourselves, and if those cages are not appropriate, we end up acting like the polar bear. We become aggressive. Uh, we lose our civil um, conditioning. We lose our humanity. I read this quote uh, once, civility costs nothing and buys everything. Sounds kind of cute, but it's true. Something maybe your grandmother might say to you. But uh, uh, it, it means a lot, uh, this quote. You know, it doesn't take any extra effort to be generous and kind. And if you are generous and kind, it will come back to you. So in our office, we like to think about ways in which we can provide a civil understanding to a social space, that we can allow people to engage with each other who may not naturally commit to one another, that there may be ways in which strangers who have different cultural backgrounds feel comfortable existing in a place that we've made for them, and that they can discuss things they might not ordinarily discuss. So one of the ways that we do that is by talking a lot before we design. And we ask ourselves, or we try to ask ourselves, a great many questions. We always say that if you have, have the, the right question, it's easier to get to the right answer. But it's impossible to have the right answer if you've never asked yourself the right question. So coming up with inter in, in, in interrogation uh, techniques is very valuable to us. And this um, is a graphic I, I made once uh, some time ago. And it's the combination of a comma and a question mark. And it suggests that the best questions lead to even more questions. So the really good ones get you to explore even further. If there's an immediate answer, that's sometimes telling you that the question isn't strong enough. And so we look for the, that type of thinking and how we approach our work. One of the things that we also say is that humans are not abstract. People are not abstractions. We're taught often in school, and I was certainly taught this when I was taught architecture, that we're interested in creating these things, these forms, these objects, and maybe some people will use them afterwards, and we'll call them users, or visitors, or something like that. They're always treated as abstractions. But people are not abstract. They're living creatures with strange behavior, and uh, needs and desires, just like any of us as architects. We like to throw the veil of civilization over ourselves to pretend that everything is going to be somehow utopian in the future if we just do the right thing. But the truth is, there is no such thing as utopia. We're just trying to manage ourselves in time in the best way that we know how. So we spend a lot of time looking at people, talking to people. This is a kind of fun picture that I like to pull out. Um, this was our old office up there where the yellow windows are. We used to look down on this bull in New York City, down in the financial district. And busloads of tourists will come to take their photograph with this bull. And as I watched the bull every day from my desk, I noticed that about 50% of the people took this photograph, and the other 50% of the people <laughs> took this photograph. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the testicles are really shiny because everyone likes to hold them and have their <laughs> photograph taken. And I've seen busloads of tourists come in do this, delicate little people, it's <laughs> And so, um, you know, it's a bit silly, and there, you know, you're probably saying, well, that's cute, but what value does it have? Um, but it suggests, to me anyway, that we are unusual creatures. And you might think that that guy is not you, and you'd never do anything like that. But there's probably something you've done in your life that's not dissimilar to this. So there is an irrational character to who we are. And many architects like to gloss over that. They like to somehow theorize that we are not these irrational creatures and that there's some kind of cognitive or intellectual framework that we can exist with in that leads to perfection. 
So, oops, sorry, I just wanted to, uh, I hit the wrong slide there. So, um, we've worked over the years on a number of projects where we've, we've tried to explore these ideas. And the first project, uh, which Michael mentioned, was our very first commission in 1989 to rebuild and revive the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt. I was uh, 28 years old when we won this commission, so not much older than many of you in, in the room today. Um, and it was a, quite a shock to be that age and have a $350 million project thrown in your lap. Um, I like to say that because we were so naive, we finished the job. If we were any more intelligent, we would have ran away the day they gave us the prize because it was a crazy project to build. It took 13 years to complete, working every day, uh, weekends and nights, uh, to make this project real. Uh, it was a fantastic experience for us. I remember when we showed up at the um, uh, ceremony to receive the prize, it was an anonymous competition, so they didn't know who we were. And these uh, 28, 29, 30-year-old kids showed up uh, with barely a penny to our name and said, Hi, we're Snoheta, and their faces went pale. They went, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know? And one of them said, well, you're too young to be the architects of this building. And we, I, I remember I just shouted out, well, it's a good thing you chose a young architect because anyone older will be dead by the time this building is finished. <laughs> It was true, so uh, we did it, and uh, there it is, and as it's, it's a far, far away place to go see, but I think now in retrospect, I look back at that building with great pride. It has a, a, a character of, of great resonance to society, and in fact, this building was uh, the sole place of peaceful resolution during the Arab Spring, and it began the democratic movement in uh, this part of North Africa, so it's had value after its uh, time. Uh, as a design. After that, we won the commission for the National Ballet and Opera in Oslo in Norway, right in our backyard at the time, and that commission was very important to us. I won't spend a lot of time because this project has been well publicized. I'll move quickly, more quickly into our current work, but many of you may have seen this project uh, published. It has these vast terraces that you can walk upon and rise up to the roof, uh, get a mid-level view of the city, uh, enjoy the city in a way that is unique uh, amongst other places uh, that are public and accessible to the public. Uh, the, the, um, the, the building has been very successful. There have been something like 9 or 10 million people that have climbed the roof of the opera. I also understand there's a small society or small club of people who have had sex on the roof of the opera. You can go onto the internet and sign your name if that's the... Uh, so, something you desire. <laughs> um, another thing that has happened uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the roof of the building is that it can be uh, used for um, public events. So, in this, in this photograph, inside the building is the uh, Opera Carmen being um, uh, watched by about 1,300 people live. And there was so much demand uh, to buy tickets for this opera, they couldn't sell enough space. So, they simulcast. Carmen, the opera, on the screen outside, and 4,500 people came and saw it for free outside the building. Very cold day, but they all braved the cold to watch it. So, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, generosity breeds civility, and civility creates a platform for all of us to somehow feel connected, no matter what our differences might be. Uh, the most extreme version of this uh, which I don't, unfortunately, have a picture of today, was when Justin Bieber played uh, there, and there were 35,000 crying teenagers. Uh, on the, you know, it's the building which I can say had the most number of people crying on it at one time that we've ever, ever designed. Uh, inside the building, it's possible to have impromptu performances in the lobby, uh, many different types of performances occurring. All spaces all throughout the building, not just in the performance halls themselves, uh, the performance hall, the great hall, the opera room itself, is designed uh, in the trajectory of great opera halls of the past 500 years. So it's a horseshoe shape, kind of U shape, as great um, opera halls were built in Venice and Paris and other cities uh, in, in the West. It has fantastic acoustics. Uh, although it was built for opera, it can house uh, musical accompaniment, so symphonies play in here as well as um, operatic uh, presentations. Uh, all of the surfaces are designed to provide the highest level of acoustics, 
So each of those balcony fronts you can see is a little bit different. Those are all formed around the way in which um, uh, uh, sound reflects off of the uh, individual surfaces. Even the chandelier at the very top, you'll see it has greater space on one side and less on the other. And that's because it's, the chandelier is reflecting the sound towards the audience rather than back at the performer. So every small piece of, of that puzzle was well considered. After we completed that project, uh, we went on to uh, win a new, new commission, this time in the United States. This is a commission for the new museum pavilion at the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site in New York City. Our project is the smallest project that you see here, this little pavilion uh, on the actual memorial grounds. These two fountains were where the original footprints of the World Trade Center towers were. And the new skyscrapers that you may be familiar with uh, ring the outside of the memorial. And our pavilion is placed as the only building on the memorial itself, which made it an extremely um, important building. And it was very high, highly criticized, I mean criticized in, in, a, in a collegial way. People were, were very focused on what it was going to be, since it was the only building on the memorial site proper. Um, our building had a, a piece of a story that we wanted to be a part of. So the memorials, the pools that you saw, are cut into the earth, and they look toward the past. The skyscrapers that you're familiar with are cut into the sky, and they're optimistic, and they look toward the future. And our building, which sat on the ground and was low and intimate, talked about the present moment in time. So it was the link between the past and the future. And in this temporal understanding, <clears throat> people would arrive at the site and be able to see different types of, of, uh, of awareness. They'd be, they'd, people would be aware of different moments in the story of this um, very tragic um, um, place uh, that has been assigned so much tragedy. I'm sorry, actually, I still get a little, you know, still pretty hard to talk about the project. Um, uh, you know, when we started this, we had to present to um, people who had lost wives and husbands and brothers and sisters uh, and, uh, you know, we went into the room where, where the, the family room, where they had the names of, of the deceased. And, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's a, such a powerful thing. It's just several thousand people uh, that, that died, really, in a very short period of time. So to make this uh, project under that kind of traumatic circumstance was, was a challenge for us. The building itself, as I mentioned, is quite horizontal and very clear in your frame of vision. You can't see the tops of the skyscrapers, nor can you see the bottom of the pool, but you can see all of this building, which means that it defines your sort of understanding of, of where you are on the ground. Uh, as you approach it at night, you can see through the atrium glass to two giant columns which were recovered from the original towers uh, that fell in September 11th in 2001. We place them in the atrium so that at night, especially, they become dramatic icons uh, for understanding uh, this important site. Uh, as you approach the building in the day, you'll notice that it is quite a bright building. Uh, we have a very special type of stainless steel facade, which is etched in a very careful way, so that as you move along the building and as the sun passes across the building throughout the day, it's always changing in its reflectivity and brightness. Even on days when there are no sun in the sky, uh, when it's just a cloudy day, the building still provides light. And it does that without electricity. Uh, so you're always experiencing that moment in, in terms of how the climate is framing the site in your context on your visit during that day. Very complicated project to build. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see here, is sort of like putting a needle through a concrete haystack. <laughs> There's a number of different projects being built on top of each other. This I-beam that you see here is actually about 13 feet deep, to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, and that's a strut that allowed us to build over the top of the path station designed by another architect below. So a great deal of technical skill went in 
to uh, creating this building and Aaron, who's here tonight, worked on this for quite some time and he's alive still to tell the story. So um, he, he really uh, took a lot of the, the challenges to make the, this building complete. Uh, as you go up the stairs into the second floor of the building, there's a very beautiful little auditorium with uh, curtains that pull to the side and give you a view of the surroundings. It's a very soft room. It calms people down when you're in this room. You know, for a lot of people to walk into a museum dedicated to this level of tragedy, there's a great deal of nervousness involved in their understanding. So we, we try to make spaces to help people relax and, 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 and um, try to appreciate the museum in, in a non-hurried, uh, non-panicky way. Um, this is upstairs, uh, outside of the auditorium, and most people don't know it, but if you walk along this wall, you can see a, a little window there. You wouldn't recognize it, but behind that window is a family room for um, the family members of the deceased. Um, it was moved out of the tower across the street and into this building after it was finished. And also, just below grade is the, the morgue, so there's still um, uh, remains of the deceased on site. That are being identified. So a uh, very unusual project and very intense. But there is a, a nice note I'd like to leave you with uh, in this project. As you uh, walk into the building and you um, uh, look at these rather magnificent columns from the original towers, you'll start to look up and see um, uh, all kinds of things. One thing that you see is the new World Trade Center tower just beyond in the distance. So here you have the original structure from the original towers juxtaposed against the new tower uh, as it's built today. So there's a connection between um, what we have created from the site of tragedy. Another thing you'll notice as you approach the building is there's almost always a long line of people pressing their nose against the glass to see what's inside of it. So if the, if the National Opera in Oslo has the most number of people crying on its roof, uh, this has the most number of nose prints of any building that we've ever made. So every day they have to come in and clean all the nose prints and people press their face against the glass to see what's inside because there are these amazing columns and they're, the way the glass is tilted you can't easily see in so it attracts you and one of the things that is very unusual about that attraction is that when you look inside you'll notice that there are other people looking back at you. <laughs> so there's a very kind of strange moment where people stick their nose against the glass and then jump back and go, ah, there's people in there, and they're looking at me. Uh, and then they get back close again, and they start to engage uh, with each other. So the people inside look at the people outside, and it's at that moment that you realize you're a part of a society. You're not thinking about the death of those that came before you, and the future of those that exist in the commercial buildings around you. You're just thinking about yourself and those people immediately adjacent to you, immediately next to you. So you're building up a kind of real connection to things that's very difficult to do in other parts of the site. And sometimes people like to go up to the glass and look at their reflection. And um, I see many people taking selfies in the glass and smiling and this young girl looking at herself dancing in the glass. I took that picture uh, very quickly, it, just, it was so perfect. And, and, and you think uh, to yourself, you know, if you can bring one smile to this place of tragedy, then we will have, have uh, accomplished what we set out to do. So that was a very uh, meaningful moment, and uh, we were happy to complete the project. But uh, something perhaps a little more straightforward and closer to home, uh, and I thought this was very relevant to show you today as we've worked on a very interesting project just about two hours driving north of here in Kingston. I mentioned it earlier. It's called the Bader Center for the Arts. And it was built for Queen's University, which might be some kind of rival university, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's just nearby uh, on the Canadian side of things. And uh, they bought a property that was um, off-site from their campus. But here gives you, just for those of you that don't know Kingston well, uh, there's uh, Highway 81 where, where I've had, I think, two uh, traffic tickets. And uh, then um, uh, leading up to the bridge that takes you over um, Thousand Islands and into Kingston. Um, so, so there uh, uh, is, a, is a symbiosis, I think, of context between Kingston 
and Syracuse, which is why I brought this project tonight. Uh, the campus is well known for its granite structures, its historical structures that are really very beautiful. It's a, it's, it has a, a nice core to the campus, very similar to Syracuse with a great deal of history. Um, but the site that they chose was well away from campus. So in fact, just a, out there in the green at a distance there against the water was the site that was chosen for this building because it had the express purpose of bringing together the citizens of the community with the students of the university. So in Canadian speak, uh, this town is known as uh, its town, gown, and crown. So the, the crown represented by the federal institutions, the national institutions, the gown represented by the school, and the town being the people that live there. And they wanted this building to bring those people together. Uh, to give you a better idea of how that site was related to the campus, up there on the right you can see this dark gray area was the core of the campus. And then along the waterfront of Lake Ontario was the site, which was called the Tet Site, named after a, actually a beer brewery that had existed there in the past. Uh, this is the view from the site. <laughs> so I, I love this picture. It looks like we've gone to the North Pole or something. And, um, of course, you're well aware of frozen lakes in this part of New York, uh, so um, it's not going to be that unfamiliar to you, but a spectacular and rather stunning sort of raw uh, way of seeing landscape. Um, on the site, there were several old stone buildings, which by North American standards were very old. They were from 1805, some of them, and they were used during World War I and World War II as military uh, encampments uh, and hospitals, uh, and they were now sort of somewhat neglected. Uh, our project um, built a performing arts center, so the auditorium was the key component of the design, alongside um, some activities for students in a film school and a lobby that would allow the local citizens to mix with the students. And there you can see the lobby. And this is one of the existing 1805 buildings on the left. And we could have actually built much closer to that building um, because of the rules, but we chose to leave this space and frame a view from the city towards uh, the lake. And uh, that became an important part of the design. Uh, there are unusual juxtapositions, uh, sort of overlaps uh, between the new and the old. We wanted the new building and so did the university to be representative of the time that it was built rather than a recreation uh, or faux historic recreation of the um, original buildings. Uh, the building should look well from the lake, uh, so it didn't just have a primary facade toward the street, toward the city, since often during the winter the lake freezes Many people will see the lake as they um, walk their dog or go out onto the, to the frozen lake uh, to recreate. Also during the summer, people come by on their boats, so uh, this became part of the iconic identity of the building. As you can see, it looks a bit like three buildings, and that's because, as I'll mention in a moment, there's an existing stone building that we had to work with here. There's a very large auditorium structure, and then the lobbies and, uh, and film school. Uh, uh, closest to you in this image. Um, the, there's a rehearsal room, uh, and as you walk along the, the, the lake shore, you're able to see into the rehearsal room uh, and as you move uh, alongside the building. This is a very nice picture looking up at the um, metal facade. So we chose a kind of stainless steel that was very, very thin. There were many good reasons to do this. A, it was really cheap, <laughs> inexpensive, and B, because it was so thin, it got these really weird dimples. And we wanted those dimples so that as the sun hit the, the surface of the stainless steel, it would reflect in all kinds of different ways. And as you moved around the building, it always seemed different. So I show you this picture, uh, which was taken in the morning. And this next picture is literally only 15 minutes after that picture was taken. So there was just a short period of time between the two as the sun was shifting on the horizon and it caught the sort of sunrise colors and it almost looks like the building is on fire um, but it's just the, the reflection of the sun uh, and if you're there at any time of day you'll see events like this occur. Inside the building is a very open gracious lobby that's never locked so that people from the city can walk in. You don't have to show your student ID. Uh, and students use the facility as well for coffee and hanging out. There's a little cafe, uh, and it overlooks the water. And the stainless steel that we clad the exterior of the building with, we wrapped onto the ceiling so that it would reflect the lake 
onto, this, onto the top of the room, and that would then in turn be reflected onto the floor. And what it looks like the building is actually going into the water, but it's really about 15 feet over the water. But we've created a sort of landscape feature, which is known as a ha, -ha where it seems like the, the, the ground drops off, but it's actually a slope, but it's hidden from view. And that's a very dramatic experience inside the lobby. Um, so uh, that uh, landscape was very important to us. And of course, you can see Syracuse here just to the east of the Five Finger Lakes, and Kingston just on the top of Lake Ontario near the Thousand Islands. There are a great many features in this region that are truly amazing, one of them being the formation of the landscape as a result of glacial ice that moved across the region uh, millennia ago. And that was a part of our thinking in uh, this project in Kingston also. Uh, there are a number of uh, landscape features that you can find in places like upstate New York and southern Ontario that are rather intriguing. And along the lakeside, you see these beautiful sedentary rocks, limestone rocks, which are built up in layers and have been revealed by erosion uh, throughout time. And we built upon that idea to create the auditorium uh, surfaces on the inside, which I'll show you in a moment. Also, occasionally the limestone will erode in cave-like structures, and you, you can see the layers from below. So we recreated such an idea on the ceiling of the main auditorium or the main music hall itself. So here's a picture of the actual structure. Uh, you can see the layering of, of the stone, the uh, striations of the wood that Im imply the same coastal features that you find at Lake Ontario. And the, the chairs are given these clusters of green color, almost like leaves that have fallen on the edge of the lake. And there's an immediate understanding of what the space is by people that live there, even though it's unlike anything they've ever seen before. Uh, here you can see another interesting feature, and that is, for those of you that know acoustics well, we have an asymmetrical ceiling, which is something you don't normally do in an auditorium. But it created a richer sound, we found, in the testing of the space. And um, all of that had to be uh, designed uh, together the ceiling, the walls, the chairs, because this room actually has no electroacoustics. So those two speakers that you see there were only temporarily down. They're, made, they're used for speech only. But whenever you play an instrument in here, those speakers are retracted. So this room seats about 700 people, and it is designed entirely to be used without any type of electrical accompaniment. So if you're playing a single violin, or a guitar on that stage, everyone in the room can hear it equally well. It's designed in the manner of the great music halls of the past. That has, that this, this way of thinking has more or less been lost in, because of technology creeping into the design of auditoriums. But we brought it way back in time. People that play there love uh, the facility. Uh, each piece, there are five types of wood. All of the wood is harvested locally in Ontario. And each of those shapes that you see is designed together with the acoustician to create the best possible sound for the space, uh, and together with, it, with the, the seating and the people that are in it. It's a shoebox shape, which is very simple. Um, we were talking earlier today with some students in an interview, and we said, we're not actually that interested in ripping apart traditional forms of design. Uh, what we'd like to do is to help make them better. Um, this shoebox style of making a theater has been around for 600 years. So we kept it, but we tried to make it better and make it perform even better uh, than it has. So we, we knew that it needed to uh, be very flexible so that it could be used by large symphonies, up to 70 people, or even in small groups, a single uh, string musician, for example, uh, on the stage. We had to do numerous tests both in physical form and in the computer. We tested every point in the, in the space electronically to determine the acoustic qualities in the room. And um, we even built together with a, uh, our acoustical engineer what is called a sound lab experience. So they built a laboratory. And you could sit in this room. It had speakers all around and uh, chairs that you could sit in. And you looked at a picture of the room, and then they would play music, and we would adjust the acoustics in electronically in the computer, and you could hear how the 
the room would change in terms of sound. It was a really great experience. And then once it was built, we even tested it then. So things had to be adjusted after it was built because no matter how good the computers are, you still today can't uh, actually recreate reality. So um, a great deal of testing was made in the space uh, after construction was, was done. We even brought in orchestra members and played in the space before um, the visitors were allowed to hear the room and everything was fine-tuned and it was a great, great uh, experience on opening day. Uh, but I did want to point out that it's actually a university building and it's very cost-efficient. So all of, we, we decided very early on to put as much money into the high-performance piece, the, the, the hall, the concert hall, and then we would be very careful with the money spent in the rest of the building. So you can see we just exposed the concrete, painted the walls, exposed the ceiling, but it made, because of the way in which we use color, it made these spaces really exciting. And they would lead you to really impressive rooms. So this is the rehearsal room uh, that's just off that corridor you saw. And it has a view out to the, to the lake. And that was the room that I said earlier you could look into as you walk by along the lake shore. The light comes in off the lake for the people that are uh, practicing here. And uh, gives them a warm tone uh, for their rehearsal. Um, that's the view of the rehearsal room from the exterior on a day that's very snowy, and I know you all don't really know what snow is here, so that's what snow looks like if you have not seen it in Syracuse. Um, the, uh, the bar and cafe are here, and all the wood that you see there is wood that was um, recaptured from the existing buildings on the site. So when they were knocked down, all the old structure was taken out, the wood structure cut back into these shapes, and we clad much of the interior with wood that we found on the site. The toilets are fantastic. Everyone loves to pee in these toilets. 